With 10.1 well underway, we are sure you've noticed an increase of, well, these dudes. Don't worry, we're sick of seeing them too. Anyway, with a bunch of heavy hitters in Season 2, we thought it's time to give you some advice on how to conquer the titans of the new meta. We're going to teach you what buffs and debuffs to look out for in Arena using Omnibar and Weak Auras. If you want a head start, then head on over to our Discord server to find links for custom PvP import strings and add-on presets. And while you're doing that, be sure to check out our brand new site-exclusive course on how to instantly gain rating. This playlist is over one hour long and teaches you vital game knowledge for climbing, including the most important spells you need to know for every class. If you want more bite-sized information, we even have additional courses teaching you counters to other meta specs. Everything at skillcap.com is backed by a rating game guarantee. Yes, we literally promise that you will go up in rating while using our guides, and if you don't, then you shouldn't pay. Visit the links below to get started, but for now, let's get back to the video. After having lurked in the shadows for a while, your favorite slippery stealthers are back. While being hit by the CC changes going into Season 2 of Dragonflight, subtlety rogues have managed to turn their misfortune into great opportunity. This season, sub-rogue damage is proving to be incredibly lethal. The finishing move to look out for is Secret Technique, which can be combined with Cold Blood for a huge multi-strike attack. When seeing these cooldowns used together, it is often a sign to use a defensive cooldown, and if paired with either Smoke Bomb or Shadowy Duel, it could also be a great time to use a Trinket, allowing you to react with a cooldown like Disarm or other forms of Micro CC to deny follow-up damage. Using your trinket recklessly against rogues can quickly lose you the game, as rogues tend to land most of their kills on a stunned target. Unfortunately, Secret Technique using Omnibar is unreliable since it has a variable cooldown, which is why it's more reliable to track Cold Blood instead. There is a less common one-shot version of Sub Rogue which incorporates flagellation into burst sequences. If the rogue is able to spend combo points while active, they will get a ramping damage bonus, which means if you see flagellation, you should buckle up for massive damage. Moving on with the recent CC changes leading into Season 2 of Dragonflight, Blizzard have tried to combat the synergy between Blind and Sap by reducing the duration of Blind to 5 seconds. This means you now have the opportunity to use an ability right as you leave Blind to avoid dropping combat, preventing the follow-up Sap. Rogues do, however, still have the opportunity to stun a target, then blind them to leave combat and Sap out, so be aware of that. Fortunately, rogues are still one of the squishiest melee in the game. Well, as long as they are stunned, trying to brute force a kill on sub rogues means having to deal with all the familiar cooldowns. But now you need to be extra cautious of Cloak of Shadows as a physical damage dealer, since the Veil of Midnight PvP talent causes Cloak to act like evasion, while also removing any physical debuffs. So, just like before, the best way to take down a sub rogue is to lock them down with stuns, sending as much burst damage as you can before they're able to react. If you don't use stuns, you will have a frustrating time dealing with their Swiss army knife of defensive cooldowns. Heading over to a class that has been taking the ladder by storm is Enhancement Shaman. While being commonly referred to as slot machines, there are ways to play around Enhancement Shamans to make them become more predictable. Enhancement Shaman's scariest cooldown is Ascendance, which is mostly paired with deeply rooted elements, giving them a low proc chance on the effect, making their attacks a 30 yard range, allowing them to stick with targets kiting or swapping to a further away target with ease. Enhancements tend to signalize their burst intentions with the use of Sundering, that gains huge value from their set bonus. Therefore, tracking the use of Sundering can be an often undervalued way of preparing for a go. Another cooldown to keep an eye out for is Doom Winds, that can be used with Ascendance or other external cooldowns for highly lethal damage. Be sure to track the cooldown of both Ascendance and Doom Winds using Omnibar so you don't get caught off guard by the huge incoming damage. Shaman offensives are often paired with Bloodlust being on a 1 minute cooldown. The great thing about Bloodlust is that it is a dispellable buff, meaning every class with a purge should immediately focus on removing it. And if you want to passively avoid damage against shamans, then definitely avoid stacking up with your teammates as this will give them more damage due to crash lightning and will make it easier to spread flame shocks. The bad news is, Enhancement has a way of forcing players to stack unwillingly using Static Field Totem, making it the main focus to kill this totem as quickly as possible. Now that we're more comfortable dealing with the offensive side of Enhancement, let's dig into the defensive side of things. Shamans now have a little Pokeball in their belt, being able to use Burrow to dig under the surface for a 5 second period, knocking up all enemies in a 6 yard range when the effect ends, while actually doing a slight bit of damage. So if you see a Shaman digging towards you, be aware of that. If you play a caster DPS, be aware that the PvP talent Seasoned Winds now last for 18 seconds while stacking up to 3 times. With Wind Shear being on a 12 second cooldown, 
It means that shamans are able to take up to 45% less damage from one school, or potentially multiple schools depending on the cast. So avoid getting chain kicked by shamans within the same 18 second duration. Last to note is that Enhancement does have a very strong hybrid healing output, making it an advantage to have them under crowd control if they're an off target or simply choosing them as the main target. Making the Shaman a main target is often the right choice in most matchups as they tend to be quite squishy while they lose the option to hybrid heal their team. Moving along to a caster that has been reigning chaos recently is Destruction Warlock. The first scary cooldown to look out for is Call Observer that with its now smaller health pool becomes a priority to kill. Should you, however, not have any CDs to kill it with the Observer, it can still be line of sighted or outranged. But be aware of ramps on maps like Knock Hudden Proving Grounds and Tiger's Peak as the eye is still able to see you from above. Another new addition to keep an eye out for is Soul Rip, adding a Mortal Strike effect on the target for 25%. This can, however, be dealt with in a very PvE manner, as the souls of the players hit by Soul Rip will spawn near them in a ghost-like animation, and running into the soul removes the debuff. As if Destruction Warlocks weren't scary enough, Bonds of Fell was buffed in 10.1. This ability encircles enemies and explodes whoever leaves the circle for a high amount of instant AoE damage split amongst all nearby enemies. Dealing with Bonds of Fell can be quite tricky, but the most obvious solution is to not leave the circle unless necessary, and if you're forced to run, then try avoiding to have three explosions going off at once, as it can be quite hard for healers to deal with. Additionally, being aware of the impending ruin that is a buff leading to some scary quickfire double Chaos Bolt setups. This alongside its bonus PvP modifier makes Chaos Bolt the most important ability to interrupt. Successfully interrupting Chaos Bolts makes the Warlock unable to use any cooldowns from both their Shadow and Fire School. With some knowledge into the offensive workings of our diabolic friends, we now will be taking a look into how you should play around their defenses. Warlocks have two major defensive cooldowns, being Unending Resolve and Dark Pact. While Unending Resolve also has the effect of making the Warlock immune to interrupt effects, a good way of dealing with this is applying any form of CC on them for the duration, as good Warlocks will often use this defensive to counter pressure. As for Dark Pact, this of course is a shield effect, which means mechanics like Wrecking Throw or Unravel are quite strong in mitigating its effect. Even though Destruction might seem like a raid boss to kill, targeting them often leads them to kite a lot and have their damage output lowered. Finally, be sure to remove curses against Warlocks whenever possible, especially when they are amplified. An amplified curse of weakness makes the target unable to crit, so be quick to dispel it or potentially consider holding off on popping major defensives until the effect fades if you're looking to take Warlocks down. Just like the other cooldowns on this list, Amplify Curse can be tracked with Omnibar, so if you see that it was recently used, look to decurse someone on your team. Having covered destruction, it's now time to bring an end to the tyranny of the true tyrants in Arena. We're of course referring to Demonology, being a spec that has seen a recent increase in participation looking to overtake the older brother, Destruction. While the defensive profile of both specs remain almost the same, the damage profiles are very different. Demonology Warlocks build up an army of wild imps from casting Hand of Gul'dan, dogs from Call Dreadstalkers, and more dogs from Summon Vile Fiend. While the damage from these pets individually might be minor, the strength is in numbers, and when every pet is summoned, it means even more damage is coming. This is because the Demo Warlock's most threatening cooldown, Summon Demonic Tyrant, which increases all pet damage while also doing massive burst damage. Tyrant will typically be joined by Fell Obelisk, which further increases the damage of the Warlock and their pets. Fortunately, there are counterplays to both. For one, the Tyrant cast itself can be interrupted, but if that's not an option, the next course of action is to deal with the Tyrant itself. There are a few ways to do this. For one, the Tyrant itself will cast a spell called Demon Fire, which is a two second cast and can easily be interrupted as well as line of sighted. This is typically why it's safest to play near a pillar during demo burst windows, since the pet's AI will struggle to deal with line of sight. Alternatively, Tyrant can be countered with CC. For instance, Warriors will often trade Intimidating Shout into Tyrant because both have a 90 second cooldown. Mages might also look to use Ring of Frost since it can CC the Tyrant and the other dog demons. But if you want to keep yourself in a forefront position of the match, kicking a hand of Gul'dan to avoid the buildup of a scary tyrant can negate most offensive pressure from the Warlock. Kicking a hand of Gul'dan is especially strong since it locks the Demo Warlock out of both Fire and Shadow Schools, meaning they cannot summon any additional pets, cast fear, or even use other damaging abilities. 
Some classes, however, can even benefit from the Warlock summoning pets. For instance, Frost Mages can have an easier time resetting their frozen orb by casting Blizzard on a lot of pets. Elemental Shamans can get up to 60% haste by casting Primordial Wave Lava Bursts on pets, as long as Flame Shock is applied to 5 targets, which should be easy considering all the wild imps that passively spawn. Demon Hunters can even passively cleave imps or other warlock pets in order to benefit from Shattered Souls, gaining a 20% damage buff for 15 seconds. Moving over to an owl that has been spreading its wings recently is Balance Druid. Even though they control the power of the moon and the sun, we'll teach you how to avoid them breezing over your lobby. The true power of Balanced Druids lies in their 3 minute cooldown Incarnation Chosen of Elune, which is a buff that lasts 30 seconds, increasing their haste and damage greatly. Tracking this using Omnibar makes you able to react and trade cooldowns ahead of time. Another cooldown to be on the lookout for is Fury of Elune, that is often the indicator of which target the Moonkin is hitting. This will appear as a large beam tracing towards the target. When Boomies press this, it typically indicates that massive burst damage is coming. Moonkins are linked with one of the most notorious combinations being the combined effect of Mass Entanglement and Solar Beam, which is a clear indicator that the Moonkin is bursting. The most obvious form of counterplay to Root Beam is any Freedom type effect, which means if you play Ret Paladin or Hunter, you should be ready to use Blessing of Freedom or Master's Call to remove the Root effect. This is also why Gnome is a popular race for Monk and Priest, since Escape Artist also removes the Root even while silenced. Using the talents Alkin Adept and High Winds makes for some quick and punishing Cyclones. Interrupting Cyclone becomes crucial to stopping their setups. Another way of dealing with Cyclone is interrupting Wrath, as Cyclone is often a part of the Druid's damage rotation. Even though Balanced Druids now have a very high damage profile and a lot of crowd control, they still are very good targets to kill, as forcing them into bear form can relieve a lot of pressure and quickly change the tides of a match. Forcing the Druid into a situation where their main objective becomes sitting bear form and clinging on for dear life is a great way to force their defensive tools as well as reducing their damage output significantly. Moving on over to healers, the first one on the list is one that has seen a few beneficial changes with the season shift, or dare I say, phase shift of the game. We're of course talking about Disciplined Priest. Disciplined Priests are one of the few healers that have multiple external buffs to help their team score kills. The first tool on the list is probably the most overpowered one, which is Power Infusion, a 25% haste increase to a teammate and with the help of the talent Twins of the Sun Priestess also grants the priest power infusion when used. Luckily, just like Bloodlust, it is a dispellable buff, meaning classes with a purge should make it their main priority to get rid of the buff. The second tool is Dark Archangel that increases the damage done by all their allies by 15% for 8 seconds. This could lead to some scary burst damage when paired with offensive cooldowns of the priest's teammates and usually signals high incoming damage. Knowing how to work around the ways disciplined priests assist their team in scoring kills, it is now time to learn how to break the barriers and score wins against them. The strongest defensive cooldown of disciplined priests is Power Word Barrier's 50% damage reduction in PvP combat. One way of dealing with the barrier is knocking enemies out of its area of effect. Some recycled tech to look out for is Fade with the new Phase Shift PvP talent and Shadow Word Death being a way for the priest to avoid incoming crowd control or damaging abilities. Juking the priest to use these spells leads them being very susceptible to incoming crowd control. Disciplined priests have two spell schools, first one being Holy, which is linked to most of their shield and healing effects, making kicking an ability such as flash heal or penance a great way of shutting down healing. The second school being Shadow is mostly linked to priest's utility options, such as void shift or pain suppression, both being ways of handling incoming bursts and relieving a target. Last thing to note is Disciplined Priests are notoriously linked with bad mana regeneration, so denying them from drinking can become crucial for the longevity of the match. Last on the list is a common face from last season, now in a less fist-fighting manner. It is, of course, the casted Mistweaver version that has been thriving well on the ladder after the recent nerfs to fistweaving. One of the major cooldowns making Mistweavers accelerate in the current meta is Revival or Restoral. The main difference between the two is that Revival also brings a cleanse to magical effects, while Restoral is able to be casted during stuns, making it the more common pick into most teams. Paired with Peaceweaver, these spells provide immunity to spells for two seconds. Mistweavers will oftentimes use this to avoid incoming crowd control, which means you might need to delay your spells slightly to try and bait out the immunity first before chaining together CC. Another major cooldown from Mistweavers is Life Cocoon, being a huge shield on the target, as well as increasing incoming heals by 50%. The main way of playing around Life Cocoon is swapping your pressure onto another target while it persists, since the shield is far too big to power through. 
Outside of Cocoon and Revival, monks really do not have any other recovering tools, meaning you can take advantage of hard pressuring as these abilities are down. Additionally, focusing on purging enveloping mists as the buff provides 30% increase to all incoming healing effects on the target. A new tool in the kit of Mistweaver this season is the recently added PvP talent Zen Spheres that can create both a defensive sphere of hope granting 15% additional healing from the monk as well as the offensive sphere of despair increasing all damage the target takes from all sources by 10% while also dealing 10% less damage to the monk. A good thing is these spheres are magic effects and can therefore be dispelled as well as purged, making it important to keep an eye out for. What makes dispelling spheres even stronger is that they now cost 0.5% mana for the monk to reapply, so constantly dispelling these can be a great way of winning the mana game. Especially since the mana regeneration of monks was recently nerfed, meaning shutting down drinks and taking advantage of both purge and dispels becomes a huge win condition against Mistweavers. While monks have some extremely good tools to help out their team, they also have quite a strong arsenal in helping themselves both slip away and decrease incoming damage. Their main tool for this is Transcendence Transfer, which is just called Port, and makes them very hard to catch up to, especially since they can teleport back to their original location within a 10 second window. So knowing how many tools monks have to deal with defensive pressure on their own behalf, it often makes them a better target to have under control unless they are caught in a stun right on top of their port. While controlling the monk with CC effects seems like a great option, an even greater option is to take advantage of the fact that Mistweavers are forced to cast a lot of their healing, making interrupts one of the strongest tools against them. Before we wrap up, if you want to improve fasting at the rating you've always wanted, then check out skillcap.com. There you'll uncover the secrets to climbing fast, learning game knowledge that is proven to help you gain rating. The best part is it's completely risk-free to try as you're kept safe with our rating game guarantee. If you don't significantly improve while actively using skill capped, then you get your money back, no questions asked. So what are you waiting for? Get the rank you've always wanted by clicking the link in the description below. All right, guys, that wraps it up for this video. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Are you enjoying season two? Tell us why or why not. As always, we want to thank you all for watching. See you soon.